thank you, Guru, for that. Um, a good welcome to, to us all this morning. I want to give you a really warm welcome, those of you who are in the church with me, and for those of you who are watching from home. And a special welcome to John Dunnett, who comes to us from CPS, our patrons, who, apart from many other things that he does, um, will, is representing our patron to help us choose a vicar. Pretty important to us. John's going to tell us a little bit later on about the work of CPS. Well, we've reached Pentecost Sunday, when in a way we celebrate the birthday of the church. And it's one of the most significant days in the church calendar. It's the day we remember the Holy Spirit first coming to the church. Pentecost, 50 days since Passover. And in Acts we read, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in response to that, I wonder if you'll say these words with me. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Amen. And now it's over to Andy and Emily for their together time. Good morning, everybody. Today is a very special day. As David has said already, today is Pentecost, the 50th day after Easter. And it's also the day that we remember the church's birthday. You know what, I love birthdays because it means that there is cake. Uh, so, sorry Andy, we've uh, run out of cake. Oh. Well, there's always a party. No, no, we've got no time for a party, but worshiping the world is later. Well, I suppose worshiping the world is going to be fun, so we can do without a party for today. But there is one thing that we have to do. Uh, what's that? We need to sing happy birthday. Oh, great, yeah, let's sing happy birthday. Uh, to the church, and if you want to join in in Makaton, you could do it as well, couldn't you? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear church, happy birthday to you. Have you ever seen one of these before? Hopefully you have. It's a present. The church began when God gave Jesus' first followers a present. We're going to hear about it in today's reading. Listen, my father has promised you something. I will send it to you. But you must stay in Jerusalem until you have received that power from heaven. So did you hear what that present was? Yeah, that's right. It was power from heaven. And that is our buzzword for today. Power. I wonder what we need power for. Cars, lights, toaster, laptop, mixing desk, torch, TV, organ, train, lawnmower. We need power for everything we do. To power us to walk and run, to power cars, to drive, to power our phones, to talk and watch YouTube. But we need a special kind of power. 
to live as Jesus' followers. And that power comes from heaven, from God. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity. God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they all work together. The Holy Spirit comes and fills us with what we need to be able to do what God calls us to do. We're like one of these, a rechargeable battery. Now when a normal battery runs out of power, we have to dispose of it. But with rechargeable ones, we can pop them into a charger and top them back up with power. As we live for Jesus, the Holy Spirit's power in us is used up, just like a battery. And we have to be recharged, refilled with the Holy Spirit every day, sometimes lots of times a day, so that we can keep doing the work that God has for us. Otherwise, we might run out of the Holy Spirit's power and stop working properly. We're going to pray together now. We're going to pray that the Holy Spirit will come and fill us up this morning. If you'd like to close your eyes to concentrate, then we'll bow your heads and feel free. Lord, we thank you so much that we have the Trinity, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come now, that we can be in its presence and be filled by it so that we can go and do more of what we've been called to do. Amen. Amen. We've been talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and the power that comes from God. And now we're gonna sing about being filled with God's power and strength. So music group, over to you. stand we know that when we do meet together in particular that we need to in church we need to say sorry for the things we've done so I wonder if you'll join with me in this prayer confession now we say together almighty God we confess that we have sinned against you for we have denied your saving presence in our lives 
and we have grieved your Holy Spirit. Come to us in the fire of your love and set our minds on the things of the Spirit that we may share his gifts and bear his fruit in love and joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we hear the words of God's forgiveness based on words from Psalm 51. The Lord hides his face from our sins and blots out all our iniquity. The Lord creates in us a pure heart and renews within us a steadfast spirit. The Lord comforts us by his Holy Spirit and restores us to the joy of our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Well, if you'd like to sit um, for our notices, and Wendy, I think you've got some bands for us. Thank you, David. And uh, may I add to that very uh, warm welcome both to John, to all of you here, and to those of you at home on this Pentecost Sunday. I publish the bands of marriage between Ryan Sean Price and Olivia Lauren McComb, both of this parish. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. And I publish the bands of marriage between Robert Anthony Simpson and Felicity Kate Helen Simmons, both of this parish. This is for the first time of asking if any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, you are to declare it. Let us pray for our couples. For Robert and Felicity, for Ryan and Olivia, may they know your presence in all their preparations for their wedding day coming up, and may they know your continued presence with them throughout their married lives together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jane Higgs, as efficient as ever, has given me a number of notices to give out this morning. The first one is about our worship in the wild at three this afternoon. Isn't it good that we've had sunshine? Do pray that that continues for the rest of the day. So that's at three o'clock here um, this afternoon. And then it's the APCM for our church on the 26th of May. Um, Zoom details are available for those of you who don't feel that you want to come here. It will be live, but also on Zoom. That's at eight o'clock here on the 26th of May. And then also to say that the May, May newsletter has now been published. Do check on your computers just to see if it's gone into junk mail rather than, um, uh, you know, come to you sort of directly. Uh, a postal mailing will arrive during this coming week for those who aren't online. Uh, the fourth thing I wanted to say before we go on to our uh, a video is... Um, a happy birthday to Matthew. We've not been giving out birthdays recently at all, but it is Matthew's birthday today, and he's one of those guys who's hiding up in the balcony, making sure things are going out. So, happy birthday, Matthew. <laughs> well, let's have our, our clips, and in our A to Z, we have reached R for reaching out, and then we will have John talking to his slides. A number of us responded to life-giving questions expressing the desire to engage more in reaching out 
and supporting others in whole life ministries. This is exciting and presents many opportunities. Within our churches, this was of course happening prior to COVID in the shape of open house, the coffee lounge, coffee break, teddies and tiny acorns and during COVID in the shape of chatties outdoors. Also, with a number of you giving generously, Feast has maintained contact with local families through the food bank and takeaway meals, including Christmas Day. Across our parish, we look forward to opening doors once again to enable Tunbridge Welcomes refugees, CDAP, DAVs, Debt Advice and other support groups to use safe spaces. You will have been inspired during lockdowns and through our A to Z of parish life to hear of community groups who work to serve others, something that our parish is well placed to do, whether as individuals or as one body. To quote Keith from the Lions, volunteering is rewarding, not only for the people we help, but also for our own sense of public duty. And Phil from the Oast Theatre, in the end, does it matter how much of anything is produced? What matters is the endless giving, done for its own sake. And in our own parish clips, viewers have seen the resourcefulness of those serving within and beyond our church's walls. So, as Christ's body here in Tunbridge, we look forward. How can our parish community continue to serve others in this way, caring not only for spiritual wellness, but also physical and mental well-being? Biblical references to whole person ministry should be taken seriously. Love your neighbour as yourself. And I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. A number of us have expressed a desire to serve in this way, so we now need to prayerfully act on this and not think everyone else is getting on with it. Our parish has four well-resourced buildings frequented with people of all ages and many talents. Each of us has daily opportunities to engage with others outside of our buildings. A few of us are now qualified mental health first aiders and health walk leaders. Across our parish, many benefit from being part of an established faith community. This should not be exclusive, and all should realise that any expression of our Christian faith can be socially contagious. We are called to meet people at their point of need and become a hub from where practical action can be coordinated. We strive to build friendships and trust will grow. Busy lives can become all-consuming and sometimes life events simply mean that we cannot be elsewhere for a while. However, let's not lose sight of what we have and what we can share, of where we are and where we can go, of how we serve and how we can serve more. To quote the phrase, many hands make light work, Please keep prayer walking your way through your days. And when God presents an opportunity to reach out, take that first step of faith, believing that you are the right person for at least the start of a journey with the person or people you encounter. From small beginnings, amazing things will evolve. And together we pray that people will discover the most precious of life's gifts. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you uh, again, because about two years ago, um, Mark invited me to come and um, preach and spend the morning with you, and it's lovely, therefore, to see some faces that I recognize, um, despite these um, masks that we're all um, wearing. Great um, to be here. And David has very kindly said, could I take just three or four minutes to tell you um, a little bit, uh, as a refresher, if you were here then, or for the first time, if you were not, about CPAS, the Church Pastoral Aid Society. Well, we are an Anglican Evangelical Mission Agency, one of the ten long-standing mission agencies recognised by the Church of England. We've been around um, since 1836, and in those days we had a very simple brief. It was to help local churches reach out with the good news of Jesus to the communities in which they were situated. Well, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since 1836. We live in a very different world. We live in a multi-faith, multicultural world, as you can see on the screen. We live in a world in which a whole generation of young people uh, are growing up without any understanding um, of the gospel. 
we live at a time when, in short, the life and witness of the church is often overshadowed by so many other things in the news and in our society. And yet it is the conviction of CPAS, and I'm sure yours too, that the message of the cross is just as relevant today as it was in 1836. So what is it that we, CPAS, do to help local churches share that message, the good news of the love of God in Christ with the communities in which they exist? Well, the first way in which we do that is by supporting the work of local churches with children and young people through holidays. We provide a whole program of holidays for 8 to 18-year-olds every summer, and in the course of any one year, we have about 4,000 different children from um, churches up and down the country who spend a week uh, at various locations, normally um, on res uh, uh, boarding school um, properties, um, having lots of fun and discovering what it means um, to be a follower of Jesus. Interestingly enough, that little picture there is not of one of those summer holidays. Um, that is what we call a school venture. And one of the things we've done in the last couple of years is partnered with a number of churches and their Church of England primary school to enable that primary school to send pupils with us as part of their religious education. Uh, and they send a whole load of youngsters with us. They send a couple of teachers along from their end. We have people from the local church involved, uh, and we host and hold the whole thing together. We've got very ambitious plans over the next five years to grow that particular ministry because it seems to tick boxes for local schools and for churches. And interestingly enough, dioceses absolutely love it. A number of bishops have come 100% on board with this particular idea. So that's one way we help local churches share the good news of Jesus. Here's a second. It is in the training of leaders. Now, when I say leaders, I mean people with dog collars, but more importantly, people without dog collars. All the people in a local church who steer and guide and make the important decisions. They can be male or female, young or old, from all kinds of different backgrounds. And in any one year, we have contact with something like 10,000 leaders from Church of England parishes um, up and down the country, um, supporting, training, resourcing, working in various ways to help them be more effective in leading their churches missionally. Uh, and then thirdly, we are involved, and you'll be aware of this, in what we call patronage in the Church of England. You're aware that now that you are looking for a new vicar, there are, as it were, three players involved. There's clearly yourself, there's the diocese, and there's your patron, and CPS happen to be your patron. We have a patronage interest in nearly 700 churches around the country, um, which actually means we have a greater patronage role than any single bishop, any single diocese in the whole of the Church of England. And it's something we take incredibly seriously because we see it as an opportunity to ensure that those churches um, have an incumbent who is absolutely committed to the authority of Scripture uh, and absolutely passionate about helping men, women, and children come to living faith in the Lord Jesus. Uh, and I'm representing CPS, so I have the, both the pleasure and the privilege of working with David and Alison as your parish reps, uh, as well as the archdeacon, to discern who God might be calling and to be your next vicar. I know that you will be praying for all of us in that process. Can I assure you that CPAS too are praying for you? In fact, and I've got a few copies of this and I'll leave them with David, in the little kind of prayer bulletin that we distribute to our supporters, we've got a little bit of a profile on you guys this time round, a picture of this building on the outside uh, and a little prompt to pray for the appointment of new, your new vicar um, on the inside. And I'll leave some of those in case you want to take um, them with you. I've given you one or two statistics and told you the areas or the ways in which we work and support local churches. But someone, I'm sure, want to say, well, tell me about your heart, John. Tell me what CPS's passion is. And it's summed up in these little sayings. We're praying for churches up and down the country that they'll be pathways to faith. We're working that every Christian, every leader might be a catalyst for evangelism. 
We're really passionate that every Christian should be a courageous witness. And we'd love, through ventures and falcons and school ventures, every child to have the chance to explore Jesus. Folks, I can't tell you in just three or four minutes everything I'd love to share with you today. So do please have a look at the website. There's the address, cpas.org.uk, for lots more information and stories. And finally, again, a thank you for the chance to be with you today. Thank you to those of you who have prayed for CPS over the years, or worked with us, or financially supported us. Um, we're enormously grateful for that, and we could not do what we do without your support. So the Lord bless you. Thank you. I can't shake your hand at the end of the service, but if you want to say hello through your masks, I'd love to reciprocate or give me a wave from home, even though, of course, the camera's one way. You ca I can't see you, but you can see me. So thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. God bless. Well, thank you, John, for sharing that, and we look forward to you um, bringing God's word to us later on. God's been enormously good to hear us here in Tunbridge, and let's give thanks for that now. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us as a church, how you have provided and guided us over the years. We pray that the Lord will continue to inspire us by your Holy Spirit to be generous with our time, our money, and our prayers to continue your work in this place. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now before our reading from a Bible which Alison will bring to us, and before John speaks to us, we sing, or you don't sing, they sing, sorry about that. And it's the song, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Glory, God is what our hearts 
let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, Lord, is what our heart longs for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Today's reading is taken from Acts 2, verses 1 to 13, and then verses 42 to 47. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray that the words we've just heard Alison read to us and the words that Andy and Emily referred us to earlier on might become living words to us this morning under the inspiration of God's Spirit. Father, we thank you for what we read in the book of Acts and what was recorded, particularly in Luke's Gospel, about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And we dare to pray now that those words written all those years ago will speak afresh to each one of us this morning. Amen. What a difference a day makes. The day you were offered that job. The day you passed that exam. 
the day you became a parent, the day that lockdown was first announced more than 12 months ago, the day your new vicar will be licensed. What a difference a day makes. And in our reading that Alison just brought to us, and in the passages that Andy and Emily referred us to, we were hearing about a day that made a difference. Because, you see, the way that Luke structures his book, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, or, to be honest, it would better be called the, the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The way that book is structured, there's a promise in chapter 1, you will receive. There's the um, day of Pentecost, the receiving in chapter 2. And then the rest of the book tells us about the ways in which the church stepped up as a result of that day. It was a defining day in the life of the church. I guess that most of you have had a look at your parish profile. That's the document that the PCC has produced in order to help us discern who God is calling to be your next um, vicar. And there's a lovely little line in that. I was rereading it yesterday that talked about your desire to participate in God's mission today. And the relevance of that phrase to this passage or this passage to that phrase is simply this that Acts chapter 2 is the start of the journey for the early church with regard to their participation in God's mission of that day. Pentecost was the day that made it possible. Pentecost was the day that kicked it off. And so what I want to do just very briefly this morning is to highlight three of the phrases that were in the reading Alison brought to us. Three phrases that I hope will have something to say to you as a church today as you look ahead to participating in God's mission today. Let's start with the obvious phrase. There in chapter 2, verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Luke says, that all the disciples who were gathered on that occasion were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but some people find that a little bit confusing because the question arises, well, hang on, hadn't the Holy Spirit already been at work in the lives of the folk living then and in the lives of those who feared God in the years and the centuries and the eras beforehand? Hadn't the Holy Spirit been present before the day of Pentecost? And of course the answer is yes. If you go right back to Genesis chapter 1, we're told the Spirit, God's Spirit, hovered over the waters. If you read Exodus 31, you'll see that Moses um, was uh, touched, enabled um, by the Holy Spirit. If you go to the story of the judges, those pre-king rulers in um, Israel, uh, we're told that the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. The psalmist writes in Psalm 139, where shall I go to flee your spirit? In other words, your spirit is everywhere. I can't escape his presence. But at the same time, right through the Bible up to this point, there is always a note of not quite yet, or a note, if you like, of expectation. So Isaiah talks about a day when the spirit will be poured out. Joel Um, has uh, God promising um, to pour out his spirit on all people. And Jesus, earlier in Luke's gospel, talks about how the Holy Spirit in the future will teach you and help you what to say. And you see, the day of Pentecost was the day all those expectations, all those not yets, was first fulfilled. And there's a very interesting word that Luke picks that we translate filled. And the word that he uses that we often translate filled is more technically translated translated baptized. Or if you want a, a more kind of evocative word, plunged into, hence this image on the screen. In other words, they were plunged into the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit was plunged into them. And so, you see, Luke is not saying you're not aware of the Holy Spirit because they were. He's not saying to them that the Holy Spirit has not been at work in your life until now because he had. What he's saying is, 
from this day onwards, it will be possible to be immersed or plunged into the life of the Spirit of God. And the life of the Spirit of God can be so um, uh, put into you that you are quite literally filled and overflowing. We've just had um, a room decorated um, at home and um, my job before the decorator came um, was to go and to choose some sample paints. And so I um, went off to B&Q and to Wix and um, we decided that in this one particular room we were going to try some kind of a green and we weren't quite sure whether to go strong green or light green or a mixture or whatever. Um, you will be amazed at the number of shades of green it is possible to choose. Um, or in some places, hints of green. So there was olive green and mint green and subtle green and fresh green uh, and every other kind of green that you could possibly um, want. All of them, a different kind of shade, a different hint, a different strength. Um, none of them simply green. And the interesting thing is that there are so many Christians who live their lives with a hint of the Holy Spirit, a shade of the Holy Spirit, but never simply and fully Holy Spirit filled. One writer said this, that too many of us are tinkered with by the Holy Spirit. Whereas, of course, Paul, writing some years after this day of Pentecost, said what we need to be is to be filled or plunged or immersed into the work and life of the Holy Spirit. Folks, if I may offer you just a sentence or two from my own experience. Um, I was brought up in a Christian home and I was a, a committed Christian with my own living faith for many years before I ever prayed that God would fill me with his Holy Spirit. I knew of the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, um, but I think if I'm being honest, um, I had a shade of or a hint of the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart and in my life. Uh, and since I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, and I say first because it has to happen again and again and again, but since that first occasion, um, I haven't in any way become a superior grade Christian. I haven't in any way become a perfect person. But the, the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart has enabled me in worship and prayer and witness. That day I first was filled with the Spirit was for me a defining day in my Christian walk. And of course that's not just something I could tell you this morning. Countless people through church history could tell you stories of how they've been filled with the Spirit and how that has impacted worship and witness and commitment to mission. It was a day that made a difference. And the question I want to ask you this morning is would you be willing each and every day this week to pray a very simple prayer? Heavenly Father, will you today fill me with your Holy Spirit? The second phrase I want to draw your attention to is in verse 42, the second part of the verses that Alison read to us because it does appear that from that defining moment where they were filled with the Holy Spirit um, certain things did change there was a difference and one of the things we read is simply this they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer now very quickly um, we need to say I don't think this is a justification for massively long endless day and night church services and I can see the sigh of relief immediately breaking out um, all over your faces I don't think that's a biblical understanding of what Luke is trying to say I think what he's wanting to say to us is that this experience of Pentecost this being filled with the spirit brought a new level of devotion not so much to church services as to seeking God and his presence in their lives and reading those words the other day, I was reminded of one or two Old Testament um, uh, verses. So, for example, when um, Moses 
says as God is leading the people on, please don't let us go from here without your presence. Or uh, the psalmist writes, Psalm 63, my soul clings to you. Or God says to Solomon, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face. Or in Hosea, we're told, seek the Lord till he showers blessing on you. Those are all verses that indicate devotion to God and the things of God. Or if you want a New Testament example, what about the boy Jesus in the temple? Didn't you know, he said to his parents when they lost him, I must be about my father's business. Even at that early age, he was devoted to his heavenly father. Or Mary and Martha, that little story where Mary sits at Jesus' feet and listening and Martha's um, cooking the dinner or whatever it is. And I, I always think she has a bit of a rough deal here because someone's got to cook the dinner, haven't they? Um, but Jesus commends Mary because she is devoted to to him. Do you know, throughout church history, there are many, many stories of where things somehow and for some reason, as it were, took off. There was a step up. Participation in God's mission suddenly seemed to break out. And again and again and again, you will find that that follows on from the devotion of individuals to seeking God and seeking his things. So if you know anything about the story of the Moravians, they were a group of Christians who moved into kind of what is now Eastern Germany in the early 1700s. And they started a round-the-clock prayer meeting that continued for the best part of 100 years. And as a community, they said, um, we want to be committed to seeking God. They were devoted to seeking God in prayer and his things. And what's really interesting is that um, over the half century that ensued from the first day they began to pray in that way, that they sent more missionaries around the world than anyone else at the time. If you jump forward to things like the 1904-1905 Welsh Revival, this is a time when God's mission just broke out in the South Welsh Valleys. What you'll find is that, um, historically speaking, that began with four blokes who went up onto the mountaintops and prayed through the night for their communities. They were devoted to seeking God for the sake of their communities. The same will be true in the Hebridean revival in the 1950s, where we're told that two very elderly sisters were devoted to praying for the people of those islands. And God did an incredible work and brought many people to living faith in the Lord Jesus. One writer provocatively, provocatively wrote this, reflecting on those kind of things. God isn't obligated to feed casual nibblers. Now we just need to be careful there because God in his graciousness does indeed feed those who casually nibble. But you get the point of what he's saying. It's a challenge to be devoted to God and his things. If we're being honest with ourselves, isn't it true that we are distracted by the many things that we're fortunate enough to have and to enjoy? And we are. We are very fortunate in world terms in all that we have. Isn't it true that we're caught up in the busyness of life? Isn't it true that sometimes it would be, quote, inconvenient to be devoted to God because there are other things that are on our minds and in our hearts? So I wonder this morning whether I can give you a, a couple of invitations. An invitation to make space for God. First thing in the morning for some of us, over a coffee in the middle of the day for others, whenever it is. Isn't that part of being devoted to God? to consciously make space for him. What about pursuing the things of God? Well, here's a question for you as you look forward to welcoming a new vicar and the next chapter of your life together in this church. What do you think might be on God's agenda for this church? And, and are you prepared to commit to supporting that and to making it happen? In what ways do you think God wants Tunbridge 
to be different. In other words, what's on God's heart for Tunbridge? And what would you be willing to do to help bring that about? Or if you like, being devoted to God is about giving priority to him, allowing him to have the final word. So here's a question. When did you last make a decision on the basis of what the Bible says about something? When did you last change your mind about what was going through your mind because of something you read in the Bible? That's what it means to be devoted to God and to the things of God. And it appears that from the day of Pentecost onwards, one of the outworkings of being filled with the Spirit was that they became devoted to God and the things of God. And then the third phrase I want to draw your attention to is in verse 47. We read this. The Lord added to their number those who were being saved. If you've read the book of Acts, you will know that the day of Pentecost was the launch pad for the global mission of the church. And in the economy of God, he so timed the day of Pentecost that it fell when people from all nations um, were in Jerusalem because of a festival at the time. And, you know, it seems to me there are two classic mistakes when we think about mission and witness and evangelism and the Holy Spirit. Um, One is that we go entirely the Holy Spirit way and we say, do you know what? Um, Mission is the work of God's Spirit, so we can just sit back and watch while he does it. Of course, the other mistake or the other extreme is that we say no no actually at the end of the day it's about humor endeavor human endeavor so if we shout louder or if we run more courses or if we have a better church website mission will work and you know the truth is neither are God's way because what we read in the book of Acts is that the early Christians grabbed every opportunity to speak and to serve and to pray and to witness, but, and this is the point of Acts 2 being here, they did so filled with the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 3, Peter, after the healing of a lame man, grabs the opportunity of being on the way to the temple to preach an impromptu sermon. When he's hauled up in front of the authorities, he uses that, as it were, tribunal, call it what you like, to share the gospel. In chapter 8 of the book of Acts, Philip, who in response to persecution flees to Samaria, uses the opportunity of finding himself in a different place, not by choice, to share the gospel. In chapter 12, Peter is in prison, and he uses that as an opportunity to share the gospel the gospel. Barnabas and Paul, after the healing of a man who's crippled from birth, use it as an opportunity to share the gospel. Even in shipwreck, Acts chapter 27, Paul uses the opportunity to share the gospel. The early church used every opportunity it had, enabled by the Holy Spirit, to speak up, to point to Jesus. And that's why we read the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Please don't hear me wrong. I'm not commending anything inappropriate. You know, those of you who um, in a post-COVID world will get back on trains and commute to London, you might be thinking, okay, well, John said I need to stand up in the carriage and preach between here and London Bridge or whichever the station is at the other end. I'm not sure I am suggesting that, though if God tells you to, you better do it. Ignore what I say. Um, I'm not sure that would necessarily be an appropriate way or moment to share the gospel. Um, It was Charles Spurgeon, the Baptist preacher, also who said, never be insensitive in the way you share the gospel. More flies are caught with honey than vinegar. That was his saying, how right and wise those words are. Two weeks ago, we remembered the 100th anniversary of the birth of John Stott, possibly the greatest evangelical preacher and leader of the 20th century. And he once said this, the Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit who created a missionary church. If the book of Acts is governed by one motif, it is the expansion of the faith through the missionary church in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So let me bring us into land. Let me finish somewhere we, near where we started by taking you back to those words that were in your parish profile where you talk about being in tune with the work of the Holy Spirit as we participate in God's mission today. I believe with my whole heart that God wants to use St. Peter's and St. Paul to bring men, women, and children into living faith in Jesus. In other words, to add to the number, to your number, those who are being saved. And I wonder whether I can invite you to take away three questions this morning just to ponder in that regard. First of all, hearing what we've heard here about this being a day that made a difference because they were filled with the Spirit, can I invite you to take away this invitation to pray each day this week to be filled with the Spirit? That's question one. Will you pray that? Here's the second question. Will you ask God to make you devoted to him and his things? Will you ask him to warm your heart with that love for him? And thirdly, can I uh, ask you to consider whether you're willing to make together a commitment to this business of adding to your number a thing of highest priority when your new vicar arrives? Because in that way, what happens here and through you out there will be to the glory and the honour of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, John, for your words and your encouragement to us. Before our time of prayer, which Luke Sage is going to lead, <clears throat> Let's say what we believe about God, our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand to say the creed. Let us declare our faith in God. We, we believe in God the Father, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We believe in Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the King of Kings, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. We believe in the Holy Spirit, giver of many gifts, proceeding from a throne on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, thank you for our church community and global family. May we remember that even in this trying time, there are our brothers and sisters across the planet congregating under the same beautiful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will always support us and one another. We give thanks for our partnership with the Diocese of Condoa and that our relationship can be used to better explore what the global Christian family looks like today. Amen. Lord, we also thank you for the return to normality we are undertaking. However, we do pray that your wisdom is with the world leaders in exercising caution and not lifting the bands too eagerly and put others to harm. We pray for all those severely affected by the pandemic, whether it be through loss of friends, family, or even financial struggle. We pray for all those who are in India that can't afford masks and still have to go to work to earn their family's food and a living. May your present spirit be with them, Lord, bringing health and warmth with it. Amen. Finally, Lord, we're sorry for our ignorance, O oh God. We have not expressed your love to our neighbours, and we pray for your guidance. On Pentecost, your disciples led the start of teaching others of your nature, so may we do the same. 
Our words have led to pain and our actions to hurt. So we do pray, Lord, that your compassionate spirit rest in our hearts and be with all of those who we interact with, that they may feel your loving light in everything we do. We bring to you five people in our hearts that we hope may find your beacon of life and hope. Amen. Finally, we now come together to say the words of our, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. if you notice the flag on your way in <laughs> well thank you all for joining us uh, those online and you within our service this morning um, for those in the service don't forget um, the social distancing uh, as we go out will you pray this prayer of dedication with me now breathe on me Holy Spirit, cleanse me and sanctify me, so I, am, I may offer all my praise, all my service, all my devotion, all my love, through Jesus the Son, to God the Father. Amen. And we hear a prayer blessing. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, may we be filled with the Spirit and make music in our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks to God our Father for everything. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen. Who could imagine? 